Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Welcome. Hi. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all here on a sunny Oregon day. Uh, thanks for spending some time with us uh, to learn about a really important uh, series of historical moments that have great bearing on our contemporary moment. Um, so welcome, my name is Christopher Nichols. I'm a history professor here at Oregon State University. Uh, I also have the pleasure of, uh, and honor uh, of directing our Center for the Humanities. Um, uh, and I also helped to found and lead uh, OSU's Citizenship and Crisis Initiative, of which uh, this talk this evening is a part. Uh, so first off, though, I always start by thanking the College of Liberal Arts Dean, Larry Rogers, uh, the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion Director, Nicole von Germanen, uh, as well as uh, the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion and the Center for the Humanities uh, for their help and leadership in making this series possible. Uh, thanks to you all for coming out, uh, to our great production team, especially Natalia Bueno, uh, who's provided really significant assistance at every step of the way. She's really a fantastic asset. Um, Suzanne Giftai, uh, Citizenship and Crisis Lead Intern Tessa Barone, uh, and a host of others who've helped make uh, the series the success it has been and hopefully that it will be in the future. Um, a little bit about the series in brief. Uh, it's an initiative um, which is a multi-year programming project that began in 2014. It actually began uh, in trying to commemorate and think about um, the meaning of World War I 100 years later uh, and some of the ways in which citizenship and crisis and war, the draft, uh, politics uh, of the pressing moment of global ca uh, cataclysm uh, could help inform not just debates about the past, but how we think about the present and maybe help to shape the future. Um, we've been thinking deeply about and trying to provoke thought related to questions of rights, obligations, limitations, and changing definitions of citizens and citizenship. We're not here to prescribe anything about the definition of citizenship, but rather to make you all, hopefully, think with you all deeply about some of these uh, questions uh, of politics, of law, of society. Um, we do all kinds of innovative formats. This is just one example, bringing in an acclaimed scholar, uh, but we do film screenings and panel discussions, visiting talks, poetry and prose readings. Uh, we've done town halls with NPR, workshops and events in Corvallis, Portland, Bend, and all over the place. So be on the lookout for our programs, please. Um, and if you have ideas about things you'd like to see, uh, please be in touch with us. Um, my email's out there, uh, but we're really eager to build programming that engages with you all, with the community, with students, with faculty, with scholars, with Oregonians, and with citizens and non-citizens of all shapes and sizes and orientations. Ours is inherently a kind of multi-generational effort. Uh, it's an effort that brings students in contact with seniors. It brings scholars in contact with lay people who maybe don't know anything about the hi history of these events. Uh, it forces us all to do more deliberative work together because of that. At its core, uh, this is part of OSU's land grant mission. This is what land grants were meant to do. They're out there, right? Uh, this isn't just uh, a marketing slogan for Oregon State. We're a program of engaged democracy for everybody, trying to bring the best insights of history and the humanities to bear on the most important questions in the world today. Uh, and the talk this evening is a superb, superb example of uh, this sort of programming, this sort of book, and these sorts of questions, asking them, being deep and rich in terms of the scholarship and penetrating in terms of the analysis. Uh, so look us up online, come to our events and support our efforts. Thanks for coming out. And now I hand over the formal introduction, Mike, uh, to my great colleague, Marisa Chappelle, a history professor here at Oregon State. Thank you. It is really an honor and a pleasure to introduce Nancy McLean today. Nancy McLean is William H. Chafe Professor of History and Public Policy at Duke University, where she teaches 20th century US history. She's also a prolific and award-winning scholar, an activist, and a public intellectual. It's difficult, in fact, to develop a syllabus in 20th century US history without using a Nancy McLean publication, I find. Her books include Behind the Mask of Chivalry, The Making of the Second Ku Klux Klan, which was named a New York Times noteworthy book. And Freedom is Not Enough, The Opening of the American Workplace, which the Chicago Tribune called contemporary history at its best. She's authored dozens of articles in both scholarly and popular outlets, as well as several books designed specifically to engage undergraduate students. 
Professor McLean's scholarship has received more than a dozen prizes and awards and has been supported by fellowships from the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Humanities Center, the Russell Sage Foundation, and the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowships Foundation. In 2010, she was elected a fellow of the Society of American Historians, which recognizes literary distinction in the writing of history and biography. She's also an award-winning teacher and a committed, exacting, and supportive graduate mentor. And this is where I get a little bit personal. I can attest to that from personal experience. She was my PhD advisor at Northwestern University a long time ago in the 1990s. With generosity and with rigor, Nancy McLean taught me to be a historian. She taught me to be a voracious and meticulous researcher, a sharp, creative and expansive thinker, and a clear and engaging writer. Most importantly, she taught me to argue boldly, though I certainly can't match her intellectual fearlessness, and I think you'll see some of that today. Professor McLean is also the model of a socially engaged scholar. She's worked to bring the insights of scholars to public policy discussions in North Carolina through the Center for the Study of Class, Labor, and Social Sustainability and Scholars for a Progressive North Carolina. And most recently, she's traveled across the country in a grueling schedule, uh, talking to students, scholars, activists, workers, and the public about her recent book, Democracy in Chains. Profiled in countless media outlets, Democracy in Chains was a finalist for the 2017 National Book Award in Nonfiction. Publishers Weekly called it a thoroughly researched and gripping narrative and a feat of American intellectual and political history. Booklist called it perhaps the best ex explanation to date of the roots of the political divide that threatens to irrevocably alter American government. And she's here to talk to us about it. Please help me in welcoming Nancy McLean. Thank you, Marisa, for that very generous introduction. Marisa was a brilliant graduate student who's gone on to become an extraordinary scholar, a deeply committed and effective teacher, and a great community builder um, and engaged scholar in her own right. So it's really a pleasure to be here and to be in Oregon for the first time. I've never been here before. It's a beautiful state. I'll be seeing a lot of it <laughs> over the next few days, and I'm very much looking forward to that. I also want to thank Chris uh, and the Center uh, for bringing me here on this, this initiative on uh, citizenship in crisis. I think it is just such an aptly named endeavor. And when I saw it uh, on the invitation, I was thrilled to come here and talk to you as part of it because citizenship is indeed in crisis now as our entire political system is in ever increasing crisis. And in fact, I think uh, for most people, it's become very clear over the last uh, year or two that our system is in deep crisis in Washington and in the state that a government that was once said to be of, by, and for the people is in profound crisis. And that even at this point, elementary norms of civic decency and truth-telling are in crisis. I think most of you know this and are aware of this, and that's probably why you're here on this beautiful Oregon day in a, in a dark auditorium with me and others. Uh, but what you might be struggling to figure out is how we reach this point and what that means. Uh, and of course, the crisis that we've reached in American public life right now, this watershed moment that we're in, this th has been fed by many different sources. And some of those have received extensive attention from scholars and journalists uh, over the, the uh, recent years. Uh, one of the streams that is fed into this movement, or this moment rather, is the kind of movement conservatism that made Barry Goldwater, the Republican candidate for president in 1964, just after after his vote against the Civil Rights Act of that year. Uh, of course, there is also the religious right that has surged uh, since the 1970s uh, and has become a very powerful force in our politics. And lately, there is the right supremacist right, which has resurf uh, resurfaced with a vengeance. So all of these are important, all of these have been studied, and all of them have helped produce the votes for the radical policy change that we're seeing now. <clears throat> 
But I'm here today to tell you about another piece of the puzzle of how we got into the dangerous situation in which we now find ourselves, a missing piece. And that is the ideas that are guiding the billionaire-funded radical right made famous by Charles Koch. And I believe that this is the missing piece uh, because it explains so much that otherwise remains mysterious. I think it's also crucial because knowing about this piece may equip citizens like those of you in this room today to help lead the way out of this mess uh, before it's too late. As a public health nurse who read the book and wrote to me, uh, expressed the situation, I think in a very apt metaphor, she said, you need to get the diagnosis right before you can determine the best treatment plan. I think that's a very helpful way of thinking about it. Because there's an unmarked hazard in our situation in America right now, and that is that the noisiest threats are getting the most attention. Among them, the now chronic uh, race baiting and bullying coming from the White House. But as the spectacle of today's presidency draws nearly all media and voter attention, an even more extreme plan is moving along a pace and largely out of uh, the public eye. In the 30 states, now totally dominated by this cause to the point of electoral stranglehold in the phrasing of the Democracy Alliance, in federal departments and agencies, and in the courts. This plan is being pursued by a much smaller cause, but one that is archly determined and breathtakingly well-funded. And this causes architects aim to rewrite the rules of our society and government permanently. I'll state my case simply. Behind all the seeming chaos and dysfunction in our public life today, there is a strategy in play, a cold-eyed, calculated strategy. And that strategy is far along. One of its field generals said this in late 2015, and I quote, we're close to winning. They, he was referring to the critics of the Koch donor network, but he might have as well have been referring to the rest of the citizenry, they don't have the real path. They don't have the real path. That was Mark Holden, the head of Koch Industries, government and public affairs operation, gloating to an invitation-only audience of billionaire and multimillionaire donors. Now, if you've been reading the news over the last several years, uh, you have heard a great deal about the fortune that Charles Koch and the donor network he has built have been investing in our politics. But what you have probably not heard about is the ideas, the ideas that have made those investments lately so devastatingly effective. And in fact, Charles Koch said at the most recent donor summit uh, that we have made, I'm quoting him uh, uh, roughly, we have made more progress in the last five years than I was able to make in the preceding 50. So this man has been at this for a long time, but now sees a real breakthrough happening. And what I learned through the course of my research was that it was an academic economist who gave Charles Koch these ideas that he refers to as technology, and in particular, who taught Koch that for capitalism to thrive, democracy must be enchained. Enchained so that it cannot do the things that citizens look to government to do in a functioning democracy, from old age retirement security, to cleaning up our air and waterways, to stopping discrimination, and more. So my book, Democracy in Chains, provides the backstory to this moment in which we find ourselves, as it also explains that real path to which Mark Holden referred. In its essence, the book is a story of two men, a thinker and a CEO whose lives converged through a shared commitment to transform the model of government that our country built up over the 20th century. The thinker was a Tennessee-born economist, James McGill Buchanan, uh, featured here on your uh, right, um, who ironically spent most of his career in Virginia public institutions of higher education. And the CEO is, of course, Charles Koch, who spent most of his adult life uh, seeking a way to make our country and the world, in fact, conform to his arch version of economic liberty, 
a kind of free reign capitalism beyond the reach of voters and their governments. The, basically, the history that my book conveys is of the crucible in which James Buchanan first came up with this idea of enchaining democracy to insulate economic liberty, and that was as the civil rights movement was transforming his adopted state of Virginia his own new campus at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, and the nation as a whole in the late 1950s and 1960s. And then the story shifts to how Charles Koch took up those ideas, found a way to weaponize them, and built an apparatus to make this idea of enchaining democracy a reality in a messianic quest that has produced the volatile situation we are now confronting. Uh, so I've shared with you uh, where we're going, <laughs> but rather than continue in that vein, I thought it would be more helpful and illuminating to uh, share with you the story of how I arrived at the, res the trail that led me to these conclusions. Uh, because I think knowing the research trail that led me to conclude what I've just stated uh, to you will give you an even sharper sense of the stakes, the stakes for our own time and for the kind of society uh, that this cause is trying to bring into being. Because it turns out that what we are seeing now in 2016, 2017, 2018, is not the first time that the libertarian right has shown itself willing to use white supremacy to advance the cause of property supremacy. That's how I've come to think about this cause, as property supremacy. And it is a property supremacy that will hurt most um, uh, devastatingly, people of color and lesser incomes, but ultimately it will affect all of us. Uh, and so, uh, what led me to believe this, to, to such a stark conclusion? In a word, serendipity. I am a historian of social movements and their impact on public life with a particular interest in the U.S. South. Uh, in 2006, I had just finished another book. I'd never heard of James Buchanan or Charles Koch. Very few people had <laughs> heard of either at this point. Most people probably don't know who James Buchanan is, so don't feel bad if you're one of those people. I was too. Um, but none of us had heard of Charles Koch if we were not in the fossil fuel industry or the libertarian movement either at that point. But I was actually pursuing a different story. Um, in the archives of the American Friends Service Committee, uh, the, the kind of action wing of the Quaker um, faith, I came across the story of Prince Edward County, Virginia whose white officials answered the U.S. Supreme Court's call to desegregate public schools without further delay by, as the white county officials put it, and I quote, going out of the public school business entirely. The county officials shuttered their entire public school system. Uh, they actually posted no trespassing signs on the shuttered public schools, padlocked the doors, and sent the white children off to private segregation academy while leaving the black children in this county with no formal education whatsoever for five years uh, to punish the students for having gone on strike for a decent high school in 1951 in one of the cases that was folded into Brown versus Board of Education and led to that Supreme Court uh, intervention. And the county officials kept these schools shut for five years until the courts compelled them to reinstate a public school system. When I came across the documentation of all of this, I was shocked and I was also rather embarrassed that as someone who had studied Southern history, who works on the history of social movements, I had never come across this before. There's actually been a few good books about it uh, in the years since I started this research, but at that point, it was not well known. And it intrigued me uh, and moved me, and so I started to dig in and very quickly found that tax funded, state provided school vouchers were crucial to this story, that they were the centerpiece of the state of Virginia's massive resistance to Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, and that seemed like an interesting backstory to the push to privatize public education now with school vouchers. So I dug in further. And 
In short order, learned that Milton Friedman, the famous uh, free market economist at the University of Chicago, had written his first manifesto for such school vouchers in 1955 in the full knowledge of how that manifesto would be used by Southern segregationists. Stunned yet again, I began following Friedman, and he became part of my story, and I could see that this was a, a story that we hadn't heard but needed to understand about the origins of both this free market project and the push to undermine our public schools. But in following a footnote, I learned of a 1959 report as this threat from Prince Edward County officials was in the air because uh, they didn't shut the schools till 1959 when they were under court order to, to desegregate. Uh, a, a 1959 report by two other economists, both trained at the University of Chicago, who had set up a new center at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville in 1956. And one of them was this James McGill Buchanan. The Economist report was an effort to refute the case that moderate white uh, Virginians were making, particularly mothers who were concerned about the fate of the, the future of the public schools and liberal clergy people. They were trying to save the schools by saying that Virginia couldn't afford two systems of education. It already had one that was struggling, and if they started draining off resources to these private schools, they would destroy the existing public school. So Buchanan and his colleague issued this report to refute that case, that Save the Schools case that the moderates were making. And effectively, what they said is that the moderates were getting the math wrong, that they needed to know their economics, because they weren't factoring in that if the state sold off all these tax-funded uh, school buildings and resources to private providers, well then, the economists suggested, they would be able to provide better education at less cost, with more competition, choice, et cetera, all those words that we hear today were there in 1959. Uh, and essentially, they were calling for privatizing Virginia's public education system before that verb, privatize, had become part of our national conversation. And they did this in the full knowledge that the schools that would be funded by these vouchers would be white segregation academies, because these were the only private schools in question in Virginia in 1959. Black parents and their organizations had made clear that they saw these vouchers as a direct insult to the constitutional rights and dignity that had just been recognized with the Brown decision. So there's no question that these vouchers were going to be going to segregationist parents who didn't want their children to go to school with African Americans. So needless to say, as a university professor myself, it stunned me to see two faculty members making a case for what their state's most arch segregationists were seeking. And it intrigued me that they did so not in racist terms, but in economic terms, consciously leveraging the authority of their discipline and Buchanan's position as the chairperson of the economics department at a university founded by Thomas Jefferson to back up what the most right-wing anti-democratic figures of the day were seeking. Buchanan and his colleague knew that they were exploiting the rage of white supremacists in Virginia and beyond to move their libertarian economic agenda. They called this agenda the free society, even though they showed no sympathy whatsoever for the civil rights activists, even on their own campus, whose mantra was freedom now. Their cover letter to state legislators making the case for uh, this, this privatization actually said they were issuing this report, quote, letting the chips fall where they may letting the chips fall where they may. And as a social historian myself, who had been in those records of the AFC, who saw what this would mean for particularly black children and black communities in Virginia, that phrase just stuck with me, letting the chips fall where they may. So the professors were acting, in other words, in full awareness of the harm that their actions would inflict. And as an educator myself, I wondered how anyone could do such a thing. Not in irrational frenzy, not in the kind of furor that you sometimes see in documentaries about the civil rights movement in the Deep South, but in cold-eyed calculation to move this other agenda. 
So with my curiosity piqued, I began seeking out more information about James Buchanan and quickly learned that he had gone on to win the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 1986, the first US Southerner to win that prize. He was awarded the prize for having developed a new school of thought called public choice economics, or public choice political economy sometimes. Uh, but this school of thought, I also learned, became influential in political science and law. It's probably more influential in political science now than in economics. Uh, and I also learned that it became extremely influential among activists and elected officials on the political right. What Buchanan did that was new in his phrase was the economic analysis of politics. That's how he referred to it. Uh, but there have been other versions of the economic analysis of politics, going back to Charles Beard, Karl Marx, and beyond. This was a distinctive economic analysis. Buchanan applied Chicago-style libertarian uh, economic assumptions to political actors to argue that they could only be understood as individuals who were seeking their own personal self-interest, not the common good as they claimed. Uh, and this led Buchanan to uh, many things, among them a new explanation of deficits that proved persuasive to some people because he made sense of why governments would overspend in times of prosperity, not just depression or recession. Uh, uh, and those ideas have since uh, interested people who are not on the right. For example, Cass Sunstein, who worked on regulatory matters under President Obama, a um, Harvard Law professor, uh, has used these ideas in a book called Nudge to think about how you might adjust the incentives in public life to ensure uh, better outcomes. So the, the ideas go beyond the right, but they were always anchored on the right. And what I learned in my research is that Buchanan's version of this larger public choice um, approach. His version, what came to be called the Virginia School of Political Economy, was always distinctive. And he himself said, looking back from a documentary, in a documentary in the New Century, that when he set to work in the late 1950s and early 1960s, the idea that actors in public life were trying to advance the common good, right? Trying to, to serve the public interest. That was dominant. People believed that. There was trust in government. And he said, this hypocrisy of calling something the public interest, that's what I wanted to tear down, he said. Uh, and this stunned me as somebody who studies citizenship and deliberative democracy to try you know, to, to make sense of how the, our ideas of the public good have changed over time. But the idea that somebody would debunk the whole notion, this, this was new to me. Uh, and so I wondered why anyone would even want to, to imagine doing that. And I learned through my research that to a libertarian like Buchanan, there is no common good. They believe that any such notion of shared purpose will lead government to coerce those who don't agree with the majority. And Buchanan and his colleagues came to argue that democracy systematically violates the individual liberty of the minority. Now, he has 20 volumes of collected works. I spent ages going through uh, 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 his private papers and those of others he was in touch with. And the only minority I saw him expressing concern with was the minority of wealthy taxpayers who did not share their fellow citizens' understanding of the public interest and the common good. And he, and you're living this, I think, we all are living this now. Uh, and Buchanan and his colleagues came to argue that government all but steals the property of such unwilling people if it taxes them for purposes they don't share. And he could be very agitational about this, even in his scholarly work, in his kind of major work of his career published in 1975 amidst panic about crime in that era, he said, what difference is there between a, a, a thug in Central Park, a rather racially coded um, uh, evocation, a thug in Central Park who steals my wallet 
and a government who takes my earnings for purposes I don't share. So he was really, really trying to drill this point home. And his concern was to kind of change the public understanding, right, of what the common good was, of what our obligations to one another are, and to make the case that we are not our brother's keepers. Or at least we shouldn't be able to use tax revenues to help one another uh, when in need. Uh, and he came to talk about all of this, too, in very very stark terms that are now widespread on the right, owing to decades of promulgation by Buchanan and his team, the think tanks with which they worked, and the officials that they coached at their centers. So I'll give you one example of this. Um, Many of you probably remember in 2012 when Mitt Romney, the Republican candidate for president, was caught taping, but uh, was taped by a, a bartender, a server at a $50,000 a plate dinner, uh, saying glibly that 47% of the people would never vote for him because they were too dependent on government. Remember that little show of hands? A lot of you, yeah, and uh, people were shocked, and many commentators believed that that lost Romney, the, the, his chance at the presidency, that people were so shocked at the way he was talking about uh, fellow American citizens and the way he was characterizing them. But what we didn't know at that time is he wasn't expressing an original idea. By the time he said that, the Heritage Foundation, which Charles Koch funds and which James Buchanan advised over the years, the Heritage Foundation was maintaining an annual index of dependency, they call it, to chart how much the rest of us rely on government uh, and to see if we are getting more back from government, say in the case of senior citizens, people with disabilities, uh, people in poverty, et cetera, whether we're getting back more than we're putting in. And it was Buchanan who gave scholarly imprimatur to this kind of thinking. He went further, in fact. He actually spoke of net tax recipients, those who get more um, materially from government than they're paying in in taxes, as, and I quote, parasites on the productive. He also warned of predators and prey. In his construction, the predators would be those going to government that in for uh, things that involve transfers of tax resources, say the uh, drug benefit for senior citizens, cleaning up you know, uh, brownfields in your community, uh, trying to stop discrimination, anything that involved any transfer of resources, those were the predators. And the prey were the wealthy taxpayers who didn't want to be charged for these things. So from my first book and my research on that, I recognized this kind of language as dehumanizing. Right? It's a kind of language that equates fellow citizens with menaces from the out, uh, animal world and actually invites us to be hostile to those people that we think are preying on us. Uh, and it is a language that is rife on the American right today. Some of you are probably already seeing it. If not, I think as you become familiar with it, you, you will hear more of it because it's really out there, in, also in this language of makers and takers. Uh, and as I read more, I learned also that for those who think this way, social justice is a very simple matter. I keep what I earn, you keep what you earn. And you, collectively, can only tax me if I agree with all of your goals and methods. And in fact, Buchanan's colleague, Walter Williams, uh, sa says just this when he's out on the conservative political action trail. Uh, but now, Buchanan himself didn't stop with pushing out this kind of analysis, believing deeply that he was right and that he was on to something and that he, he had a way to stop this, he moved in the 1970s from scholarship to organizing. And he began arguing to right-wing donors and some officials like Ed Meese, who was then the chief counselor to Governor Ronald Reagan, uh, that they needed to build what Buchanan called a counterintelligentsia. And he advised that the way to do this was to create Again, his words, a gravy train. A gravy train to bring men into the libertarian fold and train them for this intellectual battle for the new society they wanted to build. And as he did this organizing of a counterintelligentsia and worked with the emerging think tanks of that decade, he also shifted into prescriptive 
work to trying to say what should happen in a domain that he called constitutional economics. Constitutional economics. He believed, and he said more than once, that by the measure of protecting the rights of this unwilling minority of wealthy taxpayers, all existing constitutions in the world, every last one, were failures. Okay, so that's how radical the vision was. You couldn't point to any place in the world that adequately pr protected that re uh, wealthy minority in his, his view. Uh, and so he set out to design a legal regime that could protect capitalism from government, that could enshrine the rights of the wealthy minority to a degree that no society anywhere had ever done. And his timing in this proved to be quite propitious because there were some generals in Latin America in Chile in particular, who needed a new constitution as he was doing this thinking. And in 1980, the military junta of General Augusto Pinochet in Chile invited Buchanan to Santiago to try out his ideas for how to devise this constitution that would protect capitalism from government. Essentially, this dictatorship was looking for a way to um, uh, entrench the radical changes it had made while popular power was destroyed under the dictatorship to entrench those when they returned to elected rule as they were facing global pressure to do so uh, in the 1970s. But they wanted to keep in place the social security privatization that they had um, effected, which was devastating to senior citizens. In Chile, they wanted to keep in place the privatization of healthcare and the schools and all these other radical changes they had made. And through what was called the Constitution of Liberty, on which Buchanan uh, advised, they were able to do that. And that, that Constitution is still in effect today. And in 2013, Michelle Bachelet, a president who had been elected by two thirds of the Chilean people on a wide ranging reform program to get rid of this long um, uh, uh, legacy of measures, unpopular measures from the dictatorship, she got into office and realized this constitution prevented her from acting on the will of the majority. And she said that Chile needs a constitution without locks and bolts. But those locks and bolts were exactly what Buchanan was brought to Chile to uh, put in place. And I am sorry to have to tell you that this is not a story of purely historical interest. Because what's happening today as we all focus on the distractor in chief, uh, is that kind of constitution is now coming to America. Thanks to pressure from the Koch donor network and its allies uh, in state governments, uh, this cause now has in place 28 of the 34 states needed to convene a constitutional convention in our country. Now, just again, to give you a sense of how radical a departure this is, we have never had a state convene constitutional convention since that document was crafted. We have, ra we have amended the Constitution many times, sometimes wisely, sometimes foolishly, uh, but we have had many amendments that went through the normal process. This is an attempt to go around the majority and the traditional way of doing things by having what could only be a runaway uh, convention, and it is possibly a few years away at the rate things are going. And in fact, there are six Republican-controlled states that have not yet authorized a constitutional convention, which could tip over quickly with the uh, excuse of the huge deficit that the tax bill passed in December will run up, with estimates saying it will be $1.5 trillion, because the loss leader for the convention is a balanced budget amendment, but everything else will come after that. Okay, now. You might be wondering how I was able to put together the way that Buchanan's ideas were guiding this real path toward changing the fundamental rules of our society uh, to, you know, in this effort to shackle democracy. How, how, how could I figure this out? And the answer is, again, coincidence. Um, sheer serendipity. I happened to move to North Carolina in 2010 just as a radicalized Republican Party dominated by Koch-backed Tea Party figures won majorities in both houses of our state legislature in North Carolina. 
And suddenly, and here they are, by the way, suddenly uh, watching these folks, and this, by the way, is their chief funder, a man named Art Pope, who has worked with the Koch since 1980s and funded all the right-wing think tanks and such in North Carolina. He was the biggest donor to this new General Assembly, and here profiled by Jane Mayer in a piece in The New Yorker called State for Sale. Uh, so. Um, what happened is I was actually still on that school's book, but I kept getting more interested in Buchanan. He was appearing in my peripheral vision for some of these other things, and I was getting more and more interested. So I was reading into his uh, scholarly uh, work and publications, and I started to realize that what was happening in my state was his ideas being weaponized, right, <laughs> and put into effect. The same thing was happening in Wisconsin. I see someone with a Wisconsin uh, sweatshirt. I was a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin, and Scott Walker was transforming Wisconsin in the same ways at the same time, so I was also paying attention to that. But basically, I started to realize, wow, this is Buchanan's thought applied. Uh, and. Uh, the way it was being applied was in what uh, one of Koch's, or sorry, Pope, Art Pope's organizations called a big bang. They boasted of the big bang that their grantees were administering to this once um, progressive, moderate state that was a beacon to the South, that they were transforming it into a laboratory for the cause, was the boast. And they were doing so, I could see, with a technology uh, coming from public choice economics. And here I want to share what is probably the most important single finding of my book, which is that this cause is pursuing the changes that it is in the ways that it is because its architects understand that their ideas are unpopular, that people don't want to live in the kind of world they want to create, and that is why they are using stealth. And here is Charles Koch saying that in his own words in 1997 when this got going, he said to his grantees uh, at George Mason, where Buchanan worked, since we are greatly outnumbered, the failure to use our superior technology ensures failure. He's basically saying that we need to weaponize these ideas to get what we couldn't get otherwise. Okay, so how did I see this playing out in North Carolina? First, I want to frame it by letting you know that Buchanan had long urged his teammates, you know, the libertarian thinkers with which he worked, the businessmen he'd bring to his centers, the think tanks, and so forth. He said, if you don't like the outcome of public policy over a long period of time, and here you need to realize that for these arch libertarians, the whole 20th century was the long period of time that they didn't like the public policy from as citizens changed government. Uh, so he said, if you don't like like what you're seeing over a long period of time, stop focusing on who rules and think about the rules, okay? So stop thinking about individual candidates, individual figures, even political parties, and think about how you can change the whole rules of the game, of the field of play. And that's what he spent uh, the latter part of his life doing. And what I saw in North Carolina unfolding is a stunning barrage of radical rules changes on this model. To utterly disempower the moderate and liberal uh, uh, folks in, in the state and to grossly empower this unwilling wealthy minority who didn't want to support uh, 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 what their fellow citizens wanted. So among these measures, and I can't tell you all of them because they run onto pages and pages, but among them were the most radical gerrymandering and sophisticated gerrymandering we've ever seen in American history in order to misrepresent the will of the electorate so that these uh, new Republicans in the General Assembly could choose their voters rather than the voters choosing their elected officials. We saw new measures to undermine workers' ability to organize together in labor unions, particularly public sector unions. We saw attacks on public education at all levels and cuts in funding for it and changes to the governance uh, structure of public higher education. We saw repeal of a hard-won racial justice act that was designed to ensure fairness in the crim policing and, and criminal justice uh, system. We saw the refusal to accept the Medicaid expansion of the F Affordable Care Act, despite a crying need for it in our uh, largely low-wage state. And we saw the rolling back of measures to protect the environment and address climate change. With many of these measures, what we also saw was a sharp and radical break with traditional governing practices like public hearings. 
before passing significant legislation, like transparency about the process. Instead, what we saw was these legislators acting with breakneck speed, often with secrecy, sometimes doing stuff in the wee hours of the morning, you know, after midnight, after many people had left the chamber. Uh, and then, to cap all this off, when they also got the governor's uh, 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 governorship, they passed something that's come to be known as the Monster Voter Suppression Bill. And this Monster Voter Suppression Bill had some 15 different dimensions that were designed to keep people who would vote against this agenda, predictably, from voting. The, one, the case that's actionable and legal involves the racial suppression, where a judge said that they had targeted African-American voters with almost surgical pr uh, precision, was his quote. But they also targeted young people. That's not legally actionable, but they tried very hard to keep college students from being able to participate in the political process because they understood that they would not be supportive of this agenda. What proved so surreal to me as a scholar researching this and as a citizen watching this, is that I could see that this new Republican majority was applying Buchanan's ideas to get what they otherwise could not. Certainly not if they had campaigned openly for the measures they were pushing through. And again, going back to Wisconsin, Scott Walker never said he was going to destroy the power of working people in Wisconsin, right? He said he was going to address the budget shortage, but suddenly that became his biggest thing that he referred to as we drop the bomb. So it's that kind of, of, of stealth uh, conduct. Um, but also unsettling was uh, watching how the critics of all of this, because we didn't have the information then, good people who were just shocked at the U-turn their beloved state was taking, and people love North Carolina like I imagine they love Oregon, people were missing the deep operational strategy that unified these far-flung measures. They couldn't see that the men who were pushing this agenda through, and they were overwhelmingly uh, men, that they uh, were not misinformed about the likely consequences of their actions. They fully understood that as study after study documented, thousands of people would die from the lack of health care um, owing to the refusal to accept the Medicaid expansion. They knew that students' learning would be stunted by what they were doing to the schools, but they believed that their end game was worth the price. They were, you could say, yet again, in cold calculation, letting the chips fall where they may. And what my fellow critics of all of this also could not see, understandably, was that this agenda was backed by an ethical system. An ethical system that gave these actors confidence and let them feel heroic enough to weather the criticism and opposition they were getting. It is an ethical system foreign to all, of, not to all of us, to most of us. Um, uh, and so I understand why it was hard to recognize, um, but, uh, it is hard to recognize because, in fact, it's at odds with the best of every major religious tradition in the world. Um, but it is an ethical system, and it has a coherence that I think we need to understand if we're going to know how to deal with the crisis that the combination of Buchanan's ideas and Koch's money have created. So to make this very concrete, what I'm getting at on this ethical system, the libertarian morality, at least as practiced by these folks, deems it better to have people die from lack of health care than to receive it from government, from taxes paid for by others. Ultimately, this is really what they mean when they talk about personal responsibility and freedom from dependence, that you should be on your own. And in their dream world, you will be on your own for all of your needs, from health care to retirement security to the education of your children to the conditions of your community, you will be saving in their dream world for all these things in private individual savings accounts. Invested with who? A deregulated financial sector, because they don't believe in regulation either. And if you fail to save and disaster befalls you, that too will advance the cause because watching what happens to you will teach others that they need to save. It will have instructive value. 
I learned all of this and more in 2013 when James Buchanan died, and that September I was finally able to get access to his private archive at George Mason House, uh, J George Mason University, in a facility called Buchanan House. And there in Buchanan House, in his records going back to the 1950s, I found my developing understanding of all of this confirmed. Confirmed in a way that sometimes quite literally took my breath away and left me instructing myself, Nancy, breathe. <laughs> <laughs> because I just couldn't believe what I was finding. Uh, I will give you just one example. In Buchanan's private office on the second floor of uh, this uh, old uh, mansion, I found stacked helter-skelter on a chair a pile of documents that exposed how Charles Koch and some of his most trusted donors had collaborated with economists in uh, George Mason's uh, economics department, uh, with the dean of the law school, with the provost and the president of this public university, and with political appointees on the board of visitors uh, of the university, uh, George Mason University, to establish a base camp for this political program at a public university just across the Potomac from Washington, DC. And this all transpired in 1997, when Charles Koch was getting serious about having this effect. Uh, and uh, the um, uh, moment for this that I, I learned of through these documents was when uh, it, it was in this year that Charles Koch gave his first $10 million gift to George Mason uh, to support what was supposed to be the James Buchanan Center for Political Economy. It's since changed, and there's an interesting story I could tell you about that in the discussion, a little spoiler alert there. Uh, it's not called that anymore for interesting reasons. But Koch made it clear in this speech, and I should point out, by the way, he's now the most uh, largest donor to George Mason essentially owns the economics department, something called the Mercatus Center and the law school. Uh, he made it clear in the speech that accompanied his money that he wanted to see bold steps come of his investment. And he said that what he would like to do is unleash the kind of force that propelled Columbus to his discoveries, were his exact words. So he wanted to have this world historic impact, and to ensure that, he put some of his own trusted operatives in place on the campus. One of them was named Richie Fink, who had become his top political advisor. And here you see Richie Fink explaining to donors and to the faculty that they recruit into these efforts that their campus outposts are part of the political strategy, that it is, in his words, an integrated strategy in which these academic outposts and the faculty supported by them and the student grants that go out from them work together with these ideological think tanks and the dark money political spending to produce this transformation in our uh, society. So, um, pulling back from that uh, campus, uh, uh, the role of the campuses in this larger effort, uh, let me, in closing, connect it back to this larger Koch project of social and political transformation. Because when I brought back all of the materials that I had copied at Buchanan House and put them together with material I'd found in other archives and what I'd read in Buchanan's own work and that of his colleagues, I found myself laying down pieces of a puzzle that literally astounded me in its scope and audacity, its sheer audacity, because it now encompasses dozens of ostensibly separate but actually connected national organizations, some of wh whose names may be uh, familiar to you, Freedom Partners Chamber of Commerce, uh, Americans for Prosperity, the Cato Institute, the Heritage Foundation, the American Legislative Exchange Council. Charles Koch even provided the seed money for the Federalist Society, which he still supports, which has been busy choosing federal judges for this radicalized Republican Party for some years now. Anyway, if you put together those dozens of national organizations and you add to them the state level operations that make up something called the State Policy Network, which includes your own Cascade Policy Institute here in Oregon, and you add to them the international affiliates of the Atlas Network, which is operating in 90 countries with 450 affiliates, we're talking about hundreds 
of well-funded organizations working to radically alter government and society to bring this kind of free reign, unfettered capitalism into being without being honest with the people about what they're up to. But here are the kinds of uh, uh, agendas that they are working towards, even as they don't tell even the voters they depend on that this is what they're doing, trying to privatize Social Security and Medicare, among other things. So. As a historian of the South, I also realized something else as I was processing all of this. That the form of government that these men, particularly Buchanan and Koch, uh, see as liberty, as the free society of their dreams, that world would look a lot like Virginia in the 1950s in all but the state mandated racial segregation. When James Buchanan set to work in Charlottesville in 1956 with a mission, in his words, to preserve liberty, that state had just been identified by a brilliant political scientist, V.O. Key, as the most oligarchical state in the South and therefore in the nation. And V.O. Key had a, a, a somewhat wry sense of humor. So to drive home his point about how oligarchical Virginia was, he said, next to Virginia, Mississippi is a hotbed of democracy. <laughs> Think about it yourself in light of what I've uh, said here, but also in light of what you've seen unfold over more than a decade now. What really is the substance of this vision of liberty but mid-century Virginia, the state subjected in V.O. Key's terms to the most uh, thorough control by an oligarchy, and here is one of the key people who presided over that. Again, the state-mandated racial oppression would go. But I think it's important for us to understand what is happening now to realize that just about everything else in the political economy of mid-century Virginia enacts the dream of these men who are working so hard to change our world. Just a few examples. The use of right-to-work laws and other ploys to keep working people powerless. The suspicion of public education as a source of subversion. The insistence that government should not be allowed to stop discrimination or to protect uh, uh, our air and water. The deployment of states' rights legal arguments to prevent the federal government from promoting equal treatment in the states. The regressive tax system and refusal to make forward-looking public educations in things like education, like public infrastructure, and so on. The opposition to social insurance, including uh, Social Security and later Medicare, and this man, Harry Byrd, was key in fighting both of those in the Senate, and his Virginia counterpart in the House led the fight against uh, Social Security, Medicare, and the Wagner Act uh, uh, in those years. Um, and of course, voting rights restrictions to keep those unlikely to support all this away from political participation. So in short, what Virginia had at mid-century was rules. Rules that in combination ensured the uncontested sway of corporations and the wealthiest citizens. And I think that the question that this stealth plan uh, from the Koch donor network uh, we're, that we're seeing today that builds so much on this Virginia legacy uh, and crucible, I think the question this stealth plan presents us with, once we know it, is really at one level quite simple, and it is this. Do we want to live in the kind of society that this cause wants to bring into being? Do we want our children to live in the society this cause will bring into being? Our grandchildren. <laughs> Well, thank you, because I believe that is the real public choice, and you've just answered it well. Thank you. <laughs>